Hi. Hey now. Am I getting you from Pittsburgh? Yep. Cool. Well, thank you so much for your time. I was thinking about this before because I knew I was going to be dialing in to speak with you. I've seen you live with three different artists. <laughs> I was thinking about, well, I've seen him with Dokken. I've seen him with Whitesnake. I've seen him with Winger. Wow. Uh, there's not a lot of artists you can say that about, but congratulations on your new soul album. Um, when did you start making it? Oh, geez. Honestly, um, you know, I really started making it like 20 years ago, uh, <laughs> it, you know, <laughs> in 2000. I mean, as, as soon as I got a studio, as soon as um, I had stuff that was decent to record on, I started like here and there on just little parts. Um, some songs were written as far back as 1986, like Little wow. Robots and Black Magic and, um, and Cutting Loose. So uh, it was just like a project I did as a like a hobby for many years. Just it was not until COVID that I was asking Kip, gosh, what the heck should I do? <laughs> and he said, whatever happened to that fusion stuff you're always working on? I said, oh, it's done. It's been done. He said, why don't you release that? And I was like, oh, yeah, great idea. So that's how that came about. Yeah, you've always been one of those artists that, for lack of a better term, had to dumb it down a little bit because not everyone wanted to hear the fusion and all that at the beginning of your career. But at this point, it's almost like a disappointment if you don't do really complex stuff. When did you start to notice that people wanted to see you be a guitar hero, not just have top 40 hits? Well, I don't I don't know that I ever uh, saw that, to tell you the truth. Um, it was... With Bo Hill and the first two Winger records, we were really um, kind of told to to do the hit songs, you know. So we'd bring in some progressive stuff, and Bo Hill would be like, "Well, no, that you can't put that on the album; it's just too out there." Yeah. And that's why we parted from Bo Hill for the album Pull, which was a complete departure, obviously, yeah. musically. Um, and it's musicians all say it's the best winger record. It's their favorite for sure. Um, and it's my favorite as well. And so maybe that's the only instance where I can think of that. You know, I get to play lots. I'm, I'm lucky enough to be in, in white snake, you know, and, and winger of course, which is very progressive, yeah. even though a lot of people don't know that, um, you know, uh, the White Snake. What was I going to say? Oh yeah, in White Snake, I get to, I get to definitely play, especially live. Before White Snake, about a month before White Snake, I auditioned for Hall and Oates. I and didn't I, know that. Wow. I, I didn't get it because I was really nervous, and because I couldn't read the chord chart, even though I was playing it correctly, um, I played one chord with the wrong inversion. It was the right chord, but it wasn't in the right place on the neck. And the guy said, oh, you got to play it up here. And I'm like, I'm not, I don't know that chord. I'd have to go home and learn that chord like, really well before I, I'm, I'm really nervous right now. And so that's the reason that I didn't get it. Um, but a month later, I got Whitesnake. And I saw those guys from Hall & Oates a year later. And they're like, man, you're so lucky. You got that gig. It's like, it's so boring playing Rich Girl every night. You know, <laughs> they stand there, you know, with a, a guitar high up on their, on their, you know, shoulder. And, uh, you know, I, I felt really good about the fact that I got Whitesnake because it's it's uh, definitely one of the best guitar gigs to have. You know, it probably is the best guitar gig to have, you know. <laughs> yeah, I was interviewing David Coverdale a week and a half ago. And, of course, he oh. sung your praises in the midst of that. And he said that one of the things that makes him different from other band leaders is he just says, you're a great guitar player. Play it the way that you want to play it. Uh, uh, he didn't say that to me, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, either way, when I go through your discography, you just mentioned one of the things I was going to ask about, which is the Winger Pull album. And that definitely pushed the ball forward, as did the Four record. So Winger has just gotten better and better and better, but taken in a totally different direction. When I interviewed Rod, your bandmate in Winger, I think in the midst of the Poison tour, he had said something like, every night when you were doing 17, the one syncopation part kind of made 10% of the crowd turn their heads a little bit, go, whoa, those guys are musicians. <laughs> yeah, people love that part because a lot of times they don't understand 
you're like, what, what is that? What the, what the heck is it? Is this audio, by the way, or are you transcribing this? Uh, this is audio. Oh, so it's like a podcast. For yes, you. sir. Okay, cool. Yeah, so no, I love that part. And there's, a, there's lots of parts like that, actually, in a winger show. Um, and we're writing a new album now and keeping that in mind for sure, you know, even more so than, than usual. I think what Kip likes to do is to do progressive music, but almost hide it with like a poppy vocal, you know? Mm -hmm. So all the vocals have to be great hooks. Every chorus has to be a killer hook, undeniable chorus. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, do music that's not your typical chords. I came in with a bunch of ideas for this new album and he said, there's some great ideas there. He said, but on all these ideas, I when I hear the first two chords, I know what the next four chords are going to be. And that's not what we're looking for, which is fine because I'll bring it to Black Swan because that is what they're looking for. And that is what, um, you know, your typical rock bands. And that is the kind of the way I write is just straight ahead rock songs. You know, I'm very um, melodic and, and basic rock guy. Um but I can also come up with the weird stuff. Just, you know, give me some weird notes and I'll make a riff out of it. You know, and that's probably that's basically what we do with uh, with Winger. Once again, you've led me to where I was intending to go, which is I find that the lead guitarists in most of the hard rock bands, especially the Bow Hill related bands, all either wound up uh, composing music for commercials and film or going, I will never do that. And you've managed to keep a mystique over the years where people knew what bands you were in, but they never knew if you did any freelance kind of stuff. Were you ever writing for commercials? Yeah, I've done some for sure. Um, I did the biggest one I did was in San Francisco. Um, I love mother's cookies and they're so fun to me. Uh, mother's cookies. And I did the, uh, the symphony orchestra for it and wrote the lyrics with my brother um, and it was a whole, it was four commercials that aired on TV for a long time and we made good money from it. It was mother's cookies and they're still there and they're really good cookies. And, <laughs> and, uh, we wrote their, uh, their, their, you know, hook song, their motto or whatever. Um, and I've done a few other commercials, but, uh, mostly I write, you know, I'm a riff writer and, and I usually need a, a, a guy to, um, to have like, like a Kip Winger or a Jeff Bilson, who's a composer arranger. Cause I can do that, you know, but I learned it from those guys, you know, <laughs> so it's great to have those guys there. Uh, you know, you need a collaborator. I do anyway, because I can come up with riffs all day long and that's where it starts. These songs all start with me. So the pressure's on on this Winger record, you know, I sit down and Kip's like, all right, go. <laughs> I'm like, well, just, leave get up and walk around don't sit there and stare at me yeah. because you know it's up to me right here because it starts with me so uh, that's what we did just this last time i was there and he walks around and i'll play and play and play and he'll go what's that like he'll yell from the bathroom I'm, uh, and i'll be like is that good is it good <laughs> it's good let's let's do that what is that what key is that in and then you know he'll play the piano and we'll figure out what keys we can go to and then i have to come up with another riff um, and it's all if you can sing over it. How how good is it to sing over? Is Kip inspired by it? And it's the same thing with Black Swan, you know. I, I, but with Black Swan, we use ideas that I come in with. I came in with fifty ideas for that. Um, and Pilsen was like a kid in a candy store. I like that one. I like that one. And I want one of those. And give me one of those. <laughs> and that's how we wrote that. We wrote it in ten days because we had all the riffs. Once you've got the riffs, that's kind of half the battle. Wow. Are you classically trained like Kip is? Because I know Kip had his foray in ballet before, during, and after Winger. Yeah, zero. zero. I don't read music at all, which is why I didn't get Hall and Oates. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know if your music theory stopped like mine did, where you never learned sixth chords. Like, you, you knew your, your sevens, your minor sevens, you know, your <laughs> you do that kind of stuff, and then you just quit and then started playing from here from there. No, I know that what I know those chords. I just I'm not sure what they're called. Is that a six chord? Whatever. I know that chord. Um, you know, I just need to just hear it. And I'll, oh, it's that thing. I know that thing. <laughs> and was guitar your first instrument? No, piano. I was going to be Elton John. That's what I wanted. You know, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. That's that was going to be me. And um, and then I saw Kiss, and it, everything changed instantly. 
you know, screw Elton John. I'm going to be ace freely, dude. <laughs> did you cut your teeth playing in cover bands? I did. <clears throat> yeah, I, I started um, out of high school. I We summered or we wintered rather in uh, Florida. Dad had a condo there and I lived in 5A and the guy who lived in 5D played in a band. And I was better than his guitar player. So he fired his guitar player and asked me if I'd moved to Florida. And I did um, and had the greatest time of my 57 years on earth for those four years in fortune. We were the house band at Summers on the Beach and at Artstock's Playpen and at, uh, you know, the Button South. Um, and I was gorgeous and I, you know, was a good guitar player and I sang and oh, my God, it was like heaven every single night. Um but I got sick of playing top 40. Mm -hmm. So I moved to New York City and uh, had a new guy who lived there, moved in with him and got a job as a singing waiter in the Bowery right next to CBGB's. And, you know, wow. I was the only guy who wasn't an aspiring Broadway guy, you know. And so I gave everyone my tables because I could only handle like two tables at a time. And they loved me. <laughs> um, and I sang um, Elton John and Billy Joel songs. And I kicked out the piano player because he sucked. So I played the piano and sang. And I got tons of tips with my two tables. But then I heard about a audition for Fiona on Atlantic Records. Right. And it was out in Long Island because I would hang around at Manny's and Sam Ash and, you know, got to know musicians and um, went out there. And there was all these guys in spandex and giant hair. And I had on exactly what I'm wearing now in a hoodie, you know, and I walked in the audition and the guys were, you know, wearing a hoodie and jeans just like me. And they said, if you can play guitar even decently, you got the gig because of how you look. Um, and so that was Bo Hill who produced that. And I did the entire record. They had used seven guitar players before me, um, and they liked what I did. And at the end of it, Bo Hill said, listen, I don't want to insult you, but how does $500 sound for the whole album? And I was like, wow, $500, <laughs> awesome. You know, and so, you know, little did I realize that it should have been more like $4,000. But um, Bo used me on everything else he did. He told other producers about me and I ended up playing with the Bee Gees and Shaka Khan and Kenny Loggins and what? Howard Jones and Roger Daltrey and just a whole huge list because I was the go to guy at Atlantic Records because I was young and good looking and, you know, fun and and played great and uh, did it for 500 bucks. Uh, Long Island, is that referring to the Twisted Sister record and in Huntington, Long Island? Well, that was way after that I did Twisted and uh, I, I wrote with uh with d and d was the funniest man i ever worked for in my whole life i mean he had me crying laughing he is so funny and uh, he came in with these verses and choruses that were awesome i love that album i mean i did some writing i did like a bridge or an outro or i you know, pieced it together a little bit um and i asked bo if i should ask for publishing on it and he said no but you're a studio musician and you do your job you're paid a flat fee to do it and then six months later, I went to dinner with Bo, and he said, how come you never asked for publishing on that album? <laughs> you wrote a bunch of stuff on there, um, which is fine. You know, it's a great album, and uh, and I'm, I was so happy to be a part of it, really. That, I had no idea about that you had done all these ghosting kind of gigs. Were there a lot of NDAs at the time, or is it just customary to do those kinds of gigs? Um, forgive me, what's an NDA? Non-disclosures. Oh, agreement. Um no, no, um, no, <laughs> no, I was a, you know, session guy and, you know, I think they put, uh, additional guitars by Red Beach on there. Sure. I think my name was on there. And you mentioned Fiona. When my wife and I saw you played stage 48 in New York, you guys brought out Fiona. It's great uh, to see that you have all these relationships that have been going 30 to 40 years at this point. Uh, well, if you knew Fiona, I mean, I, I, I love Fiona. Fiona got me my start in the music business and, you know, she looked out for me and, uh, got me gigs when I didn't have any gigs. She put me in the movie with Bob Dylan, which was unbelievable. Put me in Bob Dylan's band, you know, um, and Fiona and I have been friends. Yeah. This whole time. But I mean, she's so awesome. She's such an awesome person that I couldn't imagine us not being friends. Hmm. And so back to your solo album, because of course, why wouldn't be 
why wouldn't we promote this great solo album you got? You mentioned being a singing waiter. It's an instrumental album. So is it that you sing, but kind of on the down low? Uh, I, my last solo album was me singing the entire thing. I so, missed that one. I do apologize. That one came out in uh, Universal Japan. That's correct. And, and you would really like it if you like 80s rock kind of music. Um, I'm very proud of it. It's the hardest thing I ever did. You know, writing, you know, lyrics and, and melodies and all that stuff was really, really intense. But it got great reviews and people love that record. And um, and my next record will be with vocals. This was just something that I needed to release because people have been bugging me about it for <laughs> honestly 15 years. So. I, I see all these guitars behind you. Are you the kind of guy that's writing every single day or at least playing every day? Um, not as much playing every day. Um, since COVID, all that's changed. I play every day because I give lessons and, um, and I'm writing for, uh, you know, Black Swan, Winger and my own stuff. So, so yeah, lately, yes. Typically, no, I don't pick up the guitar at all. When I'm, you know, Rev, the touring musician, I get home and I don't even touch the guitar for weeks. So it's, I'm not one of those guys that's practicing all the time and I'm addicted <laughs> to guitar and, you know, that's, those days are long gone. Um, but now, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm playing a lot. My playing is really good because I'm playing a lot. It's definitely improved my playing. Glad to hear. And you did have a great uh, COVID-19 era mashup kind of video where everybody performed. It looked like you edited that. Did you? The group uh, cover I, song? I, I, I don't know what you mean. Uh, edited then, it? There, there was a great video. I'm trying to think of which song what it was. that you No, it's covered. Better Days Coming. Better Days Coming, yes. Did you edit it? Because it looked like you did. I played along with the track live all the way through. That's me playing the song live all the way through. And same with Kip and same with the musicians. Is that what you're saying? Come I mean, it, there's a million edits in there of the hundred people that sent in their videos um, from I, around the world and Alice Cooper and uh, Klaus Mine and Alan Parsons and you know, the other famous people that are in that. Yeah. You, you answered, um, I asked the question poorly. It gave the vibe like you constructed the video and that you were at the helm of it. Sometimes you could tell when you look at the person's, the shots that they choose of themselves, they go, that's the guy who's behind this whole thing. So oh, I, I God, I'm not that. behind anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, Kip Winger, if Kip Winger's involved, he's the guy, I mean, you know, that guy's a shark. He's in charge. He's a, He's a teacher. He's a leader. He's like a priest, you know, um, and I'm just, I'm, you know, Bambi and, and I drink beer. <laughs> you know, I just kind of follow. I'm a follower. <laughs> well, it seems to me like Winger is the all teacher band because I know Rod teaches at Berkeley or, or at least was. You just mentioned Kip is. I know you're a guitar teacher. You used to do a lot of clinics and all that. Is Paul also a teacher? Not so much. No, Paul is a brilliant songwriter and he makes his money through writing songs for television. Wow. Okay. The, my knowledge of you has just increased about 400% and it's, <laughs> it's very intriguing. So you got time for a couple more questions and then you're a free man. Oh no. Yeah, I'm good. I, yeah. I, I'm good for a little while. Okay. Uh, what are your endorsements of the moment? Oh, just the same thing I've done forever. Um, back when I was doing twisted sister, I fell in love with this guitar on 48th street at, uh, Rudy's music stop, which was Rudy Pensa. Mm -hmm. And his guitar builder at the time was a guy named John Sir. And um, I fell in love with this Pensa guitar and used it on the Head of a Heartbreak video and then Madeline video. Um, and when I brought it in, I was doing Twisted. It was 19, I think it was 1986, 87. And D. Schneider said, you know, what the hell is that thing? It looks like a coffee table. <laughs> and it really did look like a really nice coffee table. But I, I still, I gave it to Kip as a present and it hangs in his studio. Um, but the, uh, here's the uh, exact identical wow. thing of it. And yeah. We sell, it's a Sur guitar and it's, it's a solid Koa, Hawaiian Koa body. So they're expensive, but they sound great and they play great. And I've been using them, honestly, you know, I used them on all the records and everything, but, you know, I had an Ibanez thing going on. They made a great guitar, the, uh, the Voyager. And I'd, I'd love to, you know, re-release that, that guitar one day. Cause I, I really did love that guitar too, but I've been with Sir forever. They're kind of a high end, 
um, boutique guitar company, and I also use their amps. And do I have it correct that you have an upcoming masterclass coming for Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp? Yep, I do. I think it's November 7th. It'll be my second one that I've done for them. Uh, you've been doing, as I mentioned before, clinics a lot. Um, did you ever hear of a band called Long Wave? They were on RCA for a couple of records. If it wasn't 1989, I won't know who they are. <laughs> This was probably, I don't know, 1994, 1995, something like that. But the singer of Longwave, uh, who's played with a lot of people from James Eha from Smashing Pumpkins, Dan Wilson, who wrote the Adele song, et cetera, et cetera. He went to one of your guitar clinics at the at the uh, House of Guitars in Rochester. It oh, it's a great place. It wow. changed his life, and you asked for his demo tape, and that's one of the reasons he pursued music. Do you get a lot of stories like that? I've heard a few, um, you know, <laughs> my clinics aren't like other people's clinics. I mostly just tell funny stories. You know, I'm not the technician guy that, that, uh, Paul Gilbert is, you know, or Steve Morris or Steve Vai, you know, those guys are, you know, they'll tell you that that is an, a, a Locrian scale <laughs> and a super Locrian. And, you know, I don't yeah. know any of that stuff. I taught myself how to play. So I basically just tell funny stories of all of the artists that I've worked with and, um, and, and play because I learned to play by watching other guitar players play and mostly listening to other guitar players play. And um, so I'm really glad to hear that your friend got something out of it. That's, that's really, really cool. Well, one of the other clinics that he went to at that place was Ingve, and Ingve signed his uh, guitar play Fender, Ingve. So I think you were a lot nicer. Jesus, play Fender. <laughs> I would never do that. Play Ibanez. Make sure you play Ibanez, like on your guitar, like completely ruin it, deface your guitar. <laughs> deface the music. There you go. Uh, two questions, then you're free. The first one, what is Reb Beach's favorite television show of the moment? Oh, uh, right now I'm just finishing... Um, the Amazon Prime, oh God, uh, what's his name? Uh, Billy, Billy Bob Thornton. Oh, he has a show on there. I didn't know that. He has a, oh God, I, I got to think of it. What the heck is it called? I'm, I'm drawing a blank because like I'm on the spot. Uh, but he's a, he plays a drunk lawyer. And so he's like really drunk, but he's the best lawyer ever. <laughs> and he's like hammered when he's, you know, <laughs> grilling the witnesses, you know, so it's very, very funny. Um, wow. Yeah, so that that's the one I'm, I'm watching right now. That one, the wife and I are going to have to look into. The Closer Reb, any last words for the kids? The kids? Yeah. You mean guitar playing kids? I think that at this point you have three generations of kids that are aware of you for different projects right here. So I think it's whatever kids you think might hear this. Well, uh, I, I, there would they would be different messages, I guess. If you're talking about kids wanting to get into music, um, I would say, you know, learn to write a song because there's a lot of uh, guitar players that are just the most amazing guitar players, but have absolutely no idea how to write a good song. So, so they come out and they're you know they do an album and it sucks. So. <laughs> So then no one hears about them or they join a band where someone else writes all the music. So that someone else makes all the money. So it's a good idea to, to kind of get into a little bit of composition and arranging. Um, but you know, enjoy the music and, and thank you for any fans of mine that know who I am, who's a kid. Uh, that's rare, but, uh, it, it, that would be nice. <laughs> and thanks if you've heard of me. <laughs> well, congratulations on this great new record, and it sounds like I got homework to do with the album before that. What is the name You'll of it? You'll love it. You'll love that album. I mean, everyone, I swear to God, everyone loves that album. It's called Masquerade. Okay. Masquerade is on my homework list tonight. Thank uh, you so much for your time, Reb. Looking forward to seeing you live in New York when this all blows over. Oh, God. Sounds good, Darren. Can't wait. Thanks, man. Have a great rest of the day. Okay, you too, buddy. Outro cast.